We read together to remind us of where we are going, that is towards Jesus, allowing the scriptures, the Holy Spirit, and the family of God to form a fidelity of allegiance to him alone. Please read aloud with me as we confess this together. We believe the gospel is the good news that God our Father, the Creator, out of his great love for us, has come to rescue us from sin, Satan, death, and hell, and to renew all things in and through the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf, to establish his kingdom through his people who participate in loyal allegiance in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is for God's great glory and our profound joy. Amen. Hey, good morning. Welcome to church. My name is Matthew, one of the pastors here, and it's a joy to have you in the room or watching online. I hope uh, you are going to enjoy this Independence Day weekend. I'm grateful uh, for a nation where we can gather and worship and be free to pursue God, and that's what we want to do. I'm glad we can open up Scripture today together. So if you have a copy of the Bible with you, join me in Matthew chapter 7. If you didn't bring a copy but want to follow along, you can pull out your phone and scan the QR code on the screen, and there's a spot there where you can follow along online and see the scriptures, even take some of your own notes, email them back to yourself. I think taking notes is a great way to ready yourself for the week and have a way to reference back what God spoke to you in this moment and really allow it to marinate in your heart all week long. Uh, I absolutely love, this might shock you, this might not shock you, I don't know. I absolutely love the movie Bruce Almighty. Uh, It's a little sacrilegious perhaps, but still, I'm not overly religious, so I just had a good time chuckling and laughing. Plus, I love Jim Carrey. He's probably one of my favorite uh, comedic actors uh, perhaps on the planet, and I really enjoyed it. And there's a, a scene towards the end of the movie and Bruce Almighty, where he is on the road, it's raining, he's really kind of frustrated with life and circumstances have just kind of crashed on him again and again and again, and there's like a storm raging all around him, and he's driving, he's like, God, I just need a sign, and there's like a flashing sign, get off the road now, keeps on driving, ignores it, doesn't see it, Send me a sign. God, if you're out there, send me a sign. There's like a whole truck of signs, like all flashing that he passes. It doesn't end very well for him. He's like, send me a sign. The lightning crashes and things, and all of a sudden, lights come blaring at him, and it's a truck, and it runs him over, and that's always uh, not a good thing. I highly recommend not kneeling down in the middle of a highway. But he's asking God for the sign, the sign, the sign, and all along, he's been missing the ones that God was sending. We have a tendency in our life to look for the big, the obvious, the the large signals of our world. God, send me a sign, send me a sign, send me a sign. And I think sometimes we miss the little moments where God is looking to be present fully with us in a moment that moves us into a deeper intimacy with him. Because we're looking for the outward, the spectacular, the wonderful, the amazing the large, the grand, and God is trying to get our little attention in a moment to help us hold on to peace when there's a storm brewing. I think that many of us are begging God to do a great work, and he just keeps sending us little sermons along the way. Many of us need and desperately long to see a renewal in our lives, a renewal in our land. I believe that uh, we need to see a renewal in our world. And, And I think there have been signposts over the last several years where God has been trying to get our attention so that our affection can move in the right direction, and we've just kept missing the signs. Here we are in the middle of the year, it's July, and now is the moment to kind of like recognize the halftime speech is here. Like We've lived through seven months of the year, we're here in our seventh month getting ready to turn the corner and head to the second half of the year. I think it's important that we would pause and examine and look back and see, God, where have you been faithful? Where have I seen your hand working? Where is my heart and my affection and my attention placed 
by and large in my life right now. We need to see a renewal in our, in our world. I think we need to see a renewal in our affections for Jesus, but what we keep looking for are more comforts to ease the stresses and the anxieties that we face. What we want to see is God to fix our marriage, and in order to fix our marriage, he needs to transform our selfishness, but we keep looking for the sign that he's fixing it because our spouse changes first. We want God to provide, but we keep looking for materialism instead of a prosperity and a flourishing of our soul. We keep looking for the miraculous, but God is offering us himself. And I think many times the people of God, even in scripture, were missing it. They were looking for spectacular signs and Jesus is like, yo, hi, I'm Jesus. Like they were missing the moment in front of them. They were missing something there. And for us in our life and our world as a church this year, our theme as a church is this idea of faith 2.0. We, we rolled out some new mindsets, kind of some renewed uh, mindsets that we have values as a church at the beginning of the year. We've said that this year we wanted to experience a renewal around discipleship, a renewal around being apprentices to Jesus. This, this idea of apprenticeship, and we've, we've kind of defined this year apprenticeship threefold. We, we've said that if we're going to be apprentices to Jesus, then that means we are going to grow in our relationship through our knowledge of God found in his scriptures. When we say the word knowledge, we're not just talking about intellect. We're talking about the experience. How many of you know there's something different between intellectually knowing something and experientially knowing something? You can read all the books about parenting that you want and have a lot of knowledge about parenting from the experts. But until you become a parent that's when you really know what it's like to be a parent. That's what we're looking for. As we discover scripture, it's not about having more information. It's about cultivating an intimate relationship. It's, so as apprentices, we want to know God through the scriptures. We want to practice the way of Jesus Jesus said to live a certain way, and we want to practice it and follow after it. We want our lives and our actions and our motives and our thought patterns to be patterned after the truth of who Jesus is. And, and apprentices help others to do the same. They know God through his word, they practice the way of Jesus, and they help others to do the same. Some of you are like, yeah, but I don't know enough, but do you know something? What have you learned and discovered about God? Then we can begin to entrust that and help others to learn and know that too. That's what it means to be an apprentice of Jesus. And this is what we're after. And, and we started uh, several, several weeks ago stu studying the gospel of Matthew. And in this gospel, we've kind of framed all of these talks around this idea of seeing King Jesus gospel. The King Jesus, what was the gospel that Jesus himself proclaimed? Not as the one that we've kind of picked up in our American culture. Not what is the gospel that we've kind of been handed to. Not what is the, the good news according to us. But what is the good news according to Jesus? What did he come and announce? And the gospel of Matthew kind of starts with like some backstory, giving you the story that's being told and unfold. And then Jesus arrives on the scene. And we've lately been really, really diving into what is known as the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is unfolding and announcing, here is the kingdom of God. And if you're going to participate and see and, and be in the kingdom of God, it's going to look like this. And he's kind of laying out his, um, his creed, if you will. He's kind of laying out what does it look like to follow him. He's been walking through and doing a series of teachings, and he's getting ready to come to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. We're getting ready to come to the end here in Matthew chapter 7 of the sermon. And then Matthew chapter 8 through, I think it's like 12 or something like that, turns the corner and you begin to see, get a front row seat to see the ministry of how Jesus lived out these things that he taught us about. And so he's getting ready to end this sermon and he's ending it with several warning signs. Don't miss this. This is important. You've maybe fallen asleep over the last three weeks, but here are the things that you need to get a hold of. 
Jesus is beginning to wrap up his sermon and he's beginning to help us see here some really important things that you need to see and know and understand if you're going to follow me in my kingdom and participate in the way of Jesus. And he starts these these warnings, these these cautions begin here in chapter 7. And I want to pick up in verse 7. So Matthew 7, starting in verse 7. says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. All of this is very relational language. For everyone who asks, receive. And everyone who seeks, find. And everyone who knocks, the door will be open. You parents, if your child asks for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Oh, or if they ask for uh, a fish, do you give them a snake? Oh, of course not. Oh, if you sinful people know how to good gifts, how to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts? Somebody say gifts. Give good gifts to those who ask him. Jesus is kind of alerting us. Don't miss the purpose of prayer. The purpose of prayer is not to get God's attention and to beg him to do things. The purpose of prayer is not to present your Christian wish list to God. The ultimate purpose of God is not even to see results. The purpose of prayer is to cultivate communion in relationship with Father, Son, and Spirit. To to develop a relationship with God Almighty. Not not to get our things, not to get what we want. Listen, I'm not saying that prayer doesn't change things. It does. But the primary thing that prayer wants to change is you in your relationship and perspective with the God Almighty, the creator of the universe. Does God have a problem with you asking for things? No, he's a good father. He's not annoyed by those things. But if your prayers are about getting God to do certain things, you're missing the point of prayer. In other words, Jesus is letting us know, listen, God is our Father. He has all the authority, so just humbly ask. You don't need to demand anything. I think a lot of times, I I know for me growing up in the environment of faith that I grew up, everything was about declaring and demanding and and, and telling God what you want and how to do it. And the more specific you got, the more likely he was to answer your request. I think that misses the mark, though. The mark is not to demand anything. I don't have any authority except by which God, through extension of his son, has granted to me to steward. All of your authority as a believer is a delegated authority. It still belongs to God. He's letting you borrow his name, so don't use his name in vain. We talked about that already. All the authority is delegated authority, and and to the degree that we stay submitted to God's ultimate authority in our life is the degree to which we will cultivate and grow in an understanding of who God is. God's response to asking, to seeking, to knocking, is not to give you results, it's to give you himself. Ask, seek, knock, the door's going to be open. Who's going to be on the other side of the door? Not what is going to be on the other side of the door. This is all relationship language. God is the gift that you discover and behold and and grow in and, and mature in in your prayers. It's a relationship with God that prayer is the pathway to. The point of prayer is not to get things from God, but rather to grow in a relationship with God. That's the point of prayer. God's response to our prayers... Whatever they may be, ultimately, friends, is to give you himself. Well, pastor, how, how, do, you, how do you see that or know that? He says here at the end, ask, seek, knock. Anybody who asks, seeks, finds, knocks, the doors are going to be open. And everyone who does that, it's going to be open. And so you parents, you know this. God's a father. And if fathers are good on earth and they can give good gifts, how much more will your father give you um, this good gift to those who ask? What good gift is he talking about? A new car? Right, political leaders, a better house, the job, a different boss at the same job. Like, what is it that he's going to give you? Himself. 
What is the one thing Jesus promised to give us and leave with us? The Spirit. The person of the Spirit. In, in, in original, in, in the New Testament context, in first century Judaism, gift giving wasn't like what we would think about gift giving. In their mind, in the Jewish mind, giving gifts were done intentionally to foster a reciprocal relationship. To curry the opportunity to have a relationship. There was something that was, that was going to be trying to, to, to cultivate access and opportunity to grow in a partnership and a relationship. That's why gifts were given. Don't, don't miss this, friends. Let me take you on a theological journey for just a second. Jesus said, I'm going to send you a gift. The gift is the person of the Holy Spirit. The greatest gift God will ever give you is himself that abides in you forever. What we understand is that Paul would write and he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. We often say that grace is a gift from God. It is. But grace is not an abstract ideology about God. It is the personification of the person of the Holy Spirit living in you. Grace is not just some abstract theological idea. It's the person of the Holy Spirit. But they say, well, but grace is unmerited favor. It is. You don't deserve the Spirit of God dwelling on the inside of you, but he chooses to do it anyways. In fact, the word gift and the word grace in the Greek is the same word when talking about a noun. It's the word charis. It's kind of where we also get our word charisma and charismatic. Gifts of grace. The person of the Spirit at work in your life wants to come and dwell in you and remain in you and bear fruit through you and give gifts of operation and activity in the world around you. The whole idea of the person of the Spirit is, is that it is a gift from God. So the result of your life cultivated in prayer with God is not more things and better things and other results or even the miraculous. It's the fact that the Spirit of God dwells in you and wants to cultivate a relationship with you. God's response to your prayers is to give you himself in fullness without measure. Men, can I just speak to you for a second? The greatest gift as a father you can give your kids is the gift of your presence that points them to Jesus. The greatest gift you can give your kids is to be present in their formation of a relationship with God. You're going to stand before God one day. I'm going to stand before God one day. And he's going to look as it relates to the children that he's given to us. And he's going to help you to see. He's not going to ask you, oh, they won the trophy. They won all the cheer competitions. They were in traveling ball and they excelled. They, they got the highest GPA and they've got a good college degree and they're making good money. Well done. You provided a roof over their head. He's not going to look at you and say, this is the epitome of success, dad. Way to go. You got them, tiger. No, no. God is going to be measuring it. Did you point them into a life of a relationship with your heavenly father or did you point them towards other things? That's the stewardship that we hold. So fathers, the greatest gift you can give your kids is not more things. It's modeling a present relationship with Jesus. And Jesus is giving us a warning. Don't misplace the point of prayer. Don't, mispoint the po don't, don't misapply what prayer is all about. It's about having a relationship with God. He goes on to say in verse 12, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. Jesus is helping us understand that we need to love others as we love ourselves. And in fact, here's what he's really wanting you to understand is that loving God and others requires that we decrease in our selfishness and increase in our sacrifice. You cannot love someone and remain selfish at the same time. I've done countless weddings, and each time I've done weddings and the pre-marriage coaching that we do, I want them to understand that love is not an emotion. Love is a choice. Love is a choice to sacrifice your own self for the sake of the other person instead of sacrificing the other person for your own selfishness. 
Love is a choice to sacrifice. Friends, is our selfishness hindering our posture of a servant's heart towards the people around us and towards the king? Jesus wants you to know loving God and others requires that we decrease in selfishness and increase in a posture to serve. I'm all about boundaries. One, I think you need healthy boundaries in relationships. Living as a people pleaser is a terrible idea. But you can't love someone without decreasing in selfishness. And this is what God is after, and he's reminding us of these warning signs. And then he goes on to say in verse 13, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate, the highway to hell. Uh, uh, sorry. It's soundtrack in my head. The highway to hell, he says, is really broad. And its gate is wide for many who choose that way. For many who choose that way. For many who choose that way. But the gateway is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. That is by the way that they, what's that word? By the way that they act. Can you pick up grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? No. No. A good tree produces good fruit, and bad trees produce bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their beliefs. I'm sorry, is that what it says? What's that word? Actions. By their doctrine, by the preachers that they listen to and the podcasts that they subscribe to, by the church that they go to, identify people by their actions. He goes on to say, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I'm going to reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Man, what's, talk about some warning signs here. Let's, let's unpack this for a second. The first thing Jesus is helping us to understand as it relates to the narrow gate and the wide gate is that your faith will not grow when you go with the flow of culture. There were many gates in Jerusalem, uh, and, and some of the gates were super, super wide, right? Like you could get multiple carts going in and out, horse-drawn carts all the way through. There could have been mass amount of people going one way, going another way. You could have just easily gone with the flow of traffic, and you're going to get into the city and out of the city super easy. But there were some entrances into the city that kind of climbed the wall in a meandering way and very, very narrow staircases, like, like so narrow that as you're going up, if somebody was coming down, somebody had to stop and think really Really skinny thoughts for a minute. <gasps> I oh, are you come on through, come on through, hurry, hurry, hurry. Okay, okay, good. Right, like, like you had to like totally, it was so narrow and winding and not easy, not convenient, perhaps not even obvious. And Jesus is warning us that if you're going to walk in the kingdom of God, there will be a broad road of convenience for you that you can go with the flow of. Or there is a more narrow way in which you can walk and traverse and take step by step to grow in and get closer to. Friends, we cannot go with the flow and assume we will thrive or arrive in the kingdom of God. We cannot accidentally flourish in our relationship with Father, Son, and Spirit. You can't just show up to church when it's convenient or even just glide on into church every week and be like, all right, I'm here to grow for a minute. And then we go about our week and we go live however we want based on any agenda or any thought or any moment. Jesus said it's, it's, it's narrow. Cultivating a relationship with someone takes intentionality, not just information. 
Cultivating a relationship with someone is what God is after. That we would know God and he would know us, that we would abide in him and his word would abide in us. This is what Jesus is presenting to us as the idea of what it looks like to be in the culture. And he's letting us know that, listen, there's a difference between the gates and then he talks about the fruit and then he talks about true disciples. And then when he's talking about the fruit, he's saying you can watch their actions and know. You can know what's going on in their life and see the, the sum total of their actions and know whether it's good or bad, whether they're, they're abiding with Jesus or they're abiding with their own selfishness, whether they're abiding with allegiance to Jesus or they're abiding with an allegiance to something else. You're going to be able to look and see and know. And then he flips it around and says there are some people, though, you're going to look at their action and assume that they've got it figured out they're actually missing the intimacy altogether. And he's using these two contrasts between a tree and, a, and, and like a, a vicious wolf. He's giving us a tree of, of life, something that's good, that's flourishing, and he's saying those of you who act like disciples but aren't really disciples because you're doing all the performative actions, but you've missed out on the relationship with God. And Jesus is giving us some warnings. And, and I do believe, friends, that this idea of following Jesus and fruit growing in our lives, that there would be works in our lives. Jesus himself said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, your good deeds, and glorify your Father who is in heaven. He didn't say, let your beliefs so be known before men that they may doctrinally agree with you on everything and then be argued into the kingdom of God. Have enough knowledge and insight and theological backing to quote scripture in and out. That's not what he said. Pastor, are you talking about uh, being saved by our works and our actions? No. I'm talking about having a faith that has actions. You've been saved by grace. You've been saved by a gift. You've been saved by the Spirit through faith. What is faith? Faith is the Greek word pistis. That word pistis means loyalty, trust, and allegiance. In the first century Judaism, in their culture, in the Hebrew mind, belief isn't what you thought about something you would not extrapolate or think about the affinity of something and the actions of something. We in America, we say you can have an affinity for something and your actions not fully back up with it and it still be kosher and good. It's not the case in the Hebrew mind. It's not the case in Scripture. Faith is about this, this devotion, this allegiance to Jesus as King. Friends, I believe that our belief properly aligned with the truth of who Jesus is, sets us positionally justified right in relationship to God, and believing is not primarily an act of receiving something for God, salvation, but it is, be, it is, the, it is the vehicle by which we become something like Jesus. Believing isn't an act of trying to receive something for God. Believing is the beginning point that allows us to become and transformed into the image of the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ in Ephesians chapter 4. It's about us allowing the Spirit to take residence in our life. A moment of salvation leads to a life of sanctification. It's an abiding life. It's not a moment where I, where I walked down and I prayed a prayer and I went to the water and I came back out and I lived my life however the <clears throat> highway that I wanted. How's that for like cursing but not cursing, right? Like you filled in the blank. It wasn't me. Don't miss this. Jesus is saying, you're confusing the two. Your actions are your beliefs. And they're designed to grow us in a relationship of intimacy with him. It's interesting. They say... Uh, you could look at a tree when it's being planted in the ground and not really know what kind of tree it is or what kind of fruit it will be until it grows up and matures, right? This is why we're not making judgments about people's lives based on a moment of action, but rather a life of development. 
It's about not just a moment of action. Somebody does the wrong thing. Well, that's a bad fruit right there. That person is bad, 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 bad. Let's cancel them. Cut them down right now. They, they said something dumb online. They didn't say the right thing that they needed to say. Just cancel them right now. It's not about a moment of a decision, a moment of sin, a moment of something. He's talking about a life span of development. It, it's, kind of, it's kind of like this. There's a difference between patterns and impressions. Ever been at a job interview? And when you show up at the job interview, you give them a resume, and then they ask you a bunch of questions. They are interviewing you. They are inspecting you. They are inspecting your life. And if they like the impression that you are giving them, and they're wise, you know what they're going to do next? They're going to take that good impression of you and call your references to see if the pattern of your life lines up with the impression that you gave them. This is what Jesus is talking about, about judging a tree by its fruit. Not just a moment of something, not just an impression that you have of something, but what's the life? It's, it's long obedience in the same direction that leads us into this communion with the Father. Jesus wants you to know that good fruit in someone's life is a result from their life abiding in the vine of a connected communion with the Father. Again, we, we talked about early in this collection how, how relationship with God in the Christian life, especially in our like Western world, we think of success as up and to the right, like a growth chart. But success in the mind of the biblical Hebrew and the success that Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 5 is a life that just goes in a circle and abides. A life of steadiness, a life of faithfulness, a life of loyalty without faith, without allegiance, without loyalty, it is impossible to please God. Without this faithful allegiance, without my attention being on Jesus and my actions following suit, so my affection for him continues to grow, it's impossible to please God. This is the call that Jesus, and he's giving us a warning to look at our fruit. And yeah, fruit is definitely this this metaphor for the flourishing life, a life lived over time in intimate relationship with Jesus, which is good for you and me because you're going to have moments of insignificance. You're going to have moments of doubt. You're going to have moments of failure. You're going to have moments where you don't live up to it and you are like asking God for results instead of like having communion with him. You're going to have those moments. I'm going to have those moments. But what is the pattern of our life? What is the pattern of our life? What, what is, what, who are we becoming in our apprenticeship to Jesus? Who are we becoming in our apprenticeship to Jesus? I really do believe that the fruit of our lives is the substance of intimacy with Jesus. And this is why Jesus is looking and saying, you know what? Some of you are going to show up and you're going to point out your results of all that you did for God. See, God, I served on a serve team. I went on a mission trip. I prayed for somebody one time. This person was miraculously healed when this happened. Look at all of these things. Listen, listen, listen. Are those bad things? No. We're about ready to jump into some things, the ministry of Jesus. And you're going to see in the ministry of Jesus... The kingdom of God helps set oppressed and bound and demonized people free. People who were sick found healing. People who were lost became found. People who were broken were healed. That that is a part of the ministry of Jesus. He asks us to, to be a part of that. But if we are going to do the big, spectacular, miraculous, but miss the moments of communion, Jesus is giving us a warning sign that that's a dangerous cart before the horse moment and he says somebody who only people who actually do the will of my father i was thinking about this today guys only only who does the will of my father only who does the will of my father remember how prayer isn't about getting results prayer isn't about seeing something change it's about a relationship It's about my will being submitted consistently to his will. There there are moments when people experience the miraculous, but God doesn't get the glory.
Lord, help me. I got 50 seconds. Time is arbitrary in here anyways. What are we talking about? (laughs) Jesus is looking at people who had done some miraculous and mighty things. I, I believe that God wants, in the last days, when the church becomes pure, unadulterated, our idols are cast out, our hearts become pure, and we live a repentant lifestyle in pursuit of Jesus and communion with him. We're going to see more and more miracles take place. In, in faith church, I believe with all of my heart. But there's some things that God's been trying to renew within us and prune away from us so that we can be trusted to make sure he gets the glory and nothing else. This is a really interesting phrase. Truly does the will of my Father in heaven. Does God want to see people set free from from demons? Yep. Does God want to see people healed? Yep. Something in this illustration means that it wasn't the results that were to God's will, but something behind the results missed it. If you can do the miraculous but live your life in isolation from the body of believers, you're doing it wrong. If we find ourselves in a place where we're not developing an intimacy with God, but we have a lot of intellect about God, we're missing it. Jesus says, depart, I don't, I don't, I don't know you. He didn't even say that they didn't do the miracles. He just says, I don't know you. Jesus is not looking for the spectacular in our lives. He's just looking at the substance of our loyalty and allegiance. When the substance of our loyalty and allegiance are strong, don't miss this, the Spirit has free reign to do the spectacular. But Jesus goes on to give us one final warning. He says, anyone who listens to my teachings and follows it or obeys it or does them or puts them into action is wise. Oh, like a person whose house is built on a solid rock. Though the rain comes and the torrents of the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teachings and doesn't obey these things is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand, when the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. When Jesus had finished saying all of these things, the crowds were amazed at his teachings. For he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. Why did Jesus have authority that others didn't? Because he had an intimacy with the Father that the others didn't. Jesus stayed submitted to the will of the Father at all times. He was obedient to what his Father instructed him to do. And his obedience produced this strength in spirit. Friends, obedience is the process by which we build a life of faith, of fidelity, of allegiance, of loyalty that is strong and endures until the end. I want to be a standard bearer of righteousness, friends, in a world of unrighteous living. I want to walk the narrow gate. I want want to be somebody who puts a guard over my mouth that I don't just freely gossip about whomever, whenever. I I want to be a person who practices forgiveness rather than holds on to bitter grudges. I want to be a person who renews my mind to the truth while rejecting the lies of the enemy. I want to be a person who practices the presence of God, aware of God with me, even in the mundane moments of my life. And if we can practice, if we can do these things, if we can put our lives into practice in this way, if we can walk in obedience and allegiance and loyalty to Jesus, then I believe we can rebuild our lives on the foundation that perhaps then we would 
model a way forward for our community to build a life in a way that allows a full renewal of the Spirit to be poured out. That maybe, just maybe, when communities do that, then our nation itself would be rebuilt upon a renewal of what does it look like to apprentice to Jesus again in our nation. But it all starts in my heart and your heart. It all starts in my commitment to be an apprentice and your commitment to be an apprentice. It starts with you following the warning signs and me following these warning signs. It starts with us recognizing that the authority that Jesus had that amazed the world around them didn't come because he was smarter than everybody else, because he was more intellectually aware, but because he had a submission to the Father's will that allowed a full life of flourishing in which he modeled and wants for us to. Where the gift of God is the Spirit alive in us. Where our love is not built on our own selfishness, but on our willingness to serve. Where our lives aren't about having moments of spectacular things, but rather having a substantive, long obedience of allegiance and loyalty to Jesus over time. To where people taste the fruit of our lives, they can taste and see that God is good. And when the rain comes and the winds blow and the storm rages in your life and the storm rages in my life, we have a faith not built on convenience, not built on going with the flow of culture, not built on what I think is right and only intellectually being a part of something but never intimately giving to surrender to Jesus, but a life that's built strong on the substance of my faith, faith that has action, faith that is building a life that allows hope to endure until the end because friends, there are more storms coming. And I don't want you to crash and burn. I want you standing strong, building your life on Jesus, being an apprentice to Jesus. Having a life that is in full surrender and don't miss this word communion with Jesus. Would you stand as we come to the Lord's table? If you grab the elements on your way in and would like to participate today as followers of Jesus it's our joy to get to do this. You can go ahead and begin to prepare these elements. Make sure the bread's on top and you can open it up and Get the bread out. You can flip it over and get the juice out and you can get it open and ready to go. Just hold on to it. Once you have the elements open, would you just close your eyes for a moment? Holy Spirit, what are you saying to us today? Have we looked for a ticket to heaven but no relationship with you, Holy Spirit? Have we built our life on the convenience of our culture when it's convenient or just kind of going with the flow of things? Or Lord, have we made a conscious choice and decision to pursue you, God, intentionally and intimately as your spirit beckons us and enables us? God, we know that it rains on the just and the unjust alike. The storms are not indicative of our acceptance of you. The storms are indicative of the world in which we live in. Lord, how we weather the storms often reveals where our hope has been built. Lord, we want to build our life on you, Jesus. We don't want to miss these warning signs. We want to be a part of the renewal. God, we don't want our allegiance to be misplaced our loyalty to be misplaced, our our commitment to be misplaced. God, we want it to be on you. So Lord, as we stand here with the bread and we stand here with the juice and we are about to partake of your life and covenant, Lord, ultimately it's an invitation into an intimate relationship with you, into communion with you, Father. 
And we know that that communion only takes place because of the work of Jesus and our decision to accept it and walk after it and walk in it. Thank you, Spirit of God, for moving and speaking today. Lord, this is our commitment, is to follow you, to practice our faith, to know you, and to help others along the way. So Lord, we take this bread as a part of recognizing our bodies are yours. Let's take the bread together. And Lord, as we stand here with the cup, we recognize that as we take this cup, we know that we're not standing in our own rightness, our own righteousness, but we're standing in your forgiveness, in your righteousness for us. And we do that today in faith. Let's take the juice. Lord, I pray today for your people. Lord, I pray that you would stir our hearts towards a greater devotion towards you. Lord, as we kind of look at our life and we would examine here in this halftime moment almost, God, that we would experience a true renewal of intimate relationship with you. Not of trying to perform or do things to earn something, God, but because of a response for the gift of your spirit that you gave us, may we live this out building strong faiths full of substantive allegiance to you, Lord. Forgive us for seeking the spectacular. Forgive us for, speaking, for seeking results instead of receive, seeking you, Jesus. May we seek you today and be found in you. I pray, Lord, that you would bless us and keep us. I pray, Lord, that you would make your face shine on us and be so gracious to us. Would you lift your countenance joyfully towards us and give us your peace, your shalom, your wholeness. And everywhere we go this week, may we realize that we are radically loved by you. We pray this in the name of the Father who loves us, the Son who died for us, and the Holy Spirit who abides within us, we pray. And the people of God said, amen. Hey, friends and family, I hope today's message was life-giving for you. I want to ask you to take a next step and go ahead and click the subscribe button so you never miss another chance to have an encounter with God. And while you're at it, take another step and share it with a friend. Maybe post it on your social network or text a coworker the link. And when you do that, you are partnering and get to be a part of seeing faith come to life in them. Hey, if Faith Church has made an impact in your life, if these messages are helping you gain traction in your faith, would you consider partnering with us financially? When you do that, it helps us widen our reach so that more people can have an encounter with the real Jesus. You can find information and ways to give on our central hub, faithchurchks.org. If you're at if you live in the Southeast Kansas region, we'd love to see you in person at one of our Sunday services. You can find those times on our hub as well, faithchurchks.org. Hey, remember this, God is for you and we love you.